Now the text here, Jimmy. Where should we start your service lesson on the 65 models? Well, let's start with the engines, Walt. What's the fancy-looking V8 I've seen? The one with the chrome-plated air cleaner and the oil filler cap? Well, that's a high-performance version of the 273 cubic inch engine, Jimmy. It's available in Plymouth Valiant, Plymouth Barracuda, and Dodge Dart. It has a four-barrel carburetor, high-performance camshaft, 10.5 to 1 compression ratio, and dual breaker ignition, among other features. So you'll have a new set of tune-up specs for this baby. Oh, and incidentally, you'll find the standard 273 V8 is now available in U.S.-built Plymouth Belvedere's and Dodge Coronets. Okay, I'll watch for that. What else is new? There's a special version of the 383 engine with a 9.2 compression ratio that uses regular gas. You'll find it in U.S.-built cars only. You can spot it by the single two-barrel carburetor. Speaking of carburetors, choke control on all engines has been greatly improved by adding a modulation spring to the vacuum diaphragm linkage. To understand what it does, let's review some facts about choke operation on past models without the modulation spring. When you step on the accelerator preparing to start a cold engine, the thermostatic coil force closes the choke completely for full richness. And when the engine starts, the vacuum diaphragm pulls the choke partly open to reduce richness. That's because the diaphragm force is several times greater than thermostatic coil force. Therefore, on pass models, there's only one choking position during warm-up, regardless of the temperature. Now, obviously, that one position has to be a compromise since choking needs vary with temperature. In the new design, when a cold engine starts, the vacuum diaphragm still pulls the choke to a given position. But in the process, the modulation spring is compressed. Then, as the temperature rises, closing force from the thermostatic coil decreases, letting the modulation spring open the choke farther. As a result, the choke opens gradually during warm-up. Varying the choke position during warm-up also lets us use more steps on the fast idle cam for better fast idle speed control. As a result, the new design reduces stalls in the early stages of warm-up and avoids too rich a mixture during the late stages. Recalibration of the choke has changed all the vacuum kick adjustment specs and there's a new procedure for making the adjustment. You'll find it in the reference book. Okay, fellas. Now, what's the story on these two return springs on the throttle linkage? They're part of the positive throttle return used on most models with torque fly, Jimmy. This new linkage lets the carburetor return to the closed throttle position, even if ice or binding prevents the transmission throttle lever from returning. The transmission throttle linkage is actuated by a pin from the throttle bell crank operating in a slotted link. When the driver steps on the gas, the pin bottoms in the slot and moves the transmission linkage with the carburetor linkage. Since the pin can slide in the slotted link, the carburetor returns to closed throttle instantly when the accelerator pedal is released, even if the transmission throttle lever sticks. The small spring returns the transmission throttle rod separately. That linkage has to be adjusted correctly or shift points and shift quality will be unsatisfactory. The adjustment procedure is in the reference book. Okay, Tech. Now, how about giving me the word on that new steering column torque flight shift linkage? The column-mounted shift control has an upper mechanism and lower mechanism connected by a tube, concentric with the steering column. Moving the hand lever turns the tube. This actuates a lever at the lower end of the tube, which is connected to the shift cable. The upper control mechanism consists of a hand shift lever connected to a shift housing, a gate, and a two-stage spring mechanism to load the lever against the gate. The spring-loaded hand lever is stepped to index with teeth in the gate. The gate determines shift cable movement for each range. Neutral and drive are on the same step of the gate, so you can shift back and forth between them without lifting the lever. 
reverse two and one are up one step from neutral and drive. To get into reverse two or one, the hand lever must be lifted to the first step against spring force. Now park is a higher step. To get into or out of park, raise the hand lever over the second step against a higher spring force. The increase in spring force comes from the two-stage spring mechanism. Going into reverse, two and one, you pull the lever part way up, compressing the first stage spring. To get in and out of park, you pull the lever all the way up, compressing both springs. I see. Now, how about explaining the lower control mechanism? The lower mechanism contains the shift detent and park lock mechanisms. The lower shift mechanism consists of a shift cable lever brazed to the concentric tube, a detent pawl and spring that attach to the shift lever, and an adjustable detent plate that's bolted to the steering column jacket. The shift control cable to the transmission manual valve is connected to a pin on the shift lever. Now when the driver moves the hand shift lever, the cable repositions the manual valve. The detent pawl also moves with the shift lever. The spring-loaded detent pin bottoms in one of the five notches in the detent plate. So the driver has the feel of being in gear. I see. Now, how does the park control work? Another pin on the shift lever travels in a slot in the park lever. The park lever is supported by the stationary park lever pivot bolted to the steering column jacket. As the hand lever is shifted through the one, two, drive, neutral, and reverse positions, the park lever actuating pin just slides in the slot without causing any park lever movement. When the control is moved into park, the direction of the slot changes, causing the whole park lever to pivot. This actuates the cable to the parking sprag in the transmission. How about the adjustments now, Walt? There are two adjustments on the lower control. You make them both with the hand lever held firmly in manual low. It's mighty important to hold that lever tight and low, or the gate positions could be off. Right, Tech. Now, first we check to see if the park actuating pin is right at the end of the park lever slot. If there's any clearance, you'll have to adjust it. To adjust the park lever, loosen the three pivot attaching bolts and rotate the pivot so the pin is firmly at the end of the slot. Then, tighten the pivot bolts. The other adjustment is the detent plate. The detent pin must be bottomed firmly in the first notch in manual low. The detent plate has elongated mounting holes. Just loosen the attaching bolts to make the adjustment. Better tell Jimmy about the other equipment that's actuated by the shift tube, Walt. Right, Tech. The backup light switch is mounted on the column jacket and actuated by a lever from the gear shift tube. The mounting holes are elongated to provide an adjustment. The same thing applies to the Imperial parking brake vacuum release valve. Both adjustments are covered in the reference book. On some models, the backup light operating lever has a connecting link or cable to the shift indicator on the instrument panel. The pointer position can be adjusted at the lever. Okay, uh, Tech, but hold it just a minute. No one said anything about the shift control hookup at the transmission. What's the story? Why, I thought he knew. Didn't you, Walt? Sure. The transmission has the console control type valve body with the six detent manual valve lever and park over travel adapter. Adjustments are the same as for 1964 console shift torque flights. Here's a little tip on adjusting the park lock cable. Pull the cable out gently to its travel limit. Then release the force and tighten the clamp bolt. If you load the cable, the sprag will drag on the pin, causing a raspy sound and feel during shifting. Okay, Tech, I'll watch that. What's next? We'll find that out as soon as someone turns the record over. The extension bushing in an A904 torque flight transmission is replaced by a heavy-duty thrust-type ball bearing. 
You can service the new bearing and seal with current special tools, though. With the ball bearing, there's no output shaft end play. You check end play in the transmission gear train at the forward end of the input shaft, the same as on the A727 torque flight. A sliding spline front universal joint yoke is used on all cars with the A727 transmission, except Imperial. A bushing is used with a sliding yoke and the ball bearing is moved forward in the extension housing. The sliding yoke is sealed by an integral lip seal and boot on the outside, and by a groove seal inside. The inner seal prevents transmission fluid from mixing with spline lube. To remove the boot seal, you cut away part of the boot and use the recommended buttress thread puller. Incidentally, there's a new special tool to install the boot seal. A new double-ended tool is used to remove the extension bushing and install a new one to the correct depth. Is there a special tool for the bearing, too? Nope. The bearing is retained by two snap rings on the shaft. A large snap ring locks the outer race to the extension housing. To remove the bearing, you remove the extension housing and the rear snap ring. Then, slide the extension housing back in place Lock the large snap ring and tap rearward on the housing to remove the bearing. Here's a little tip on removing the extension housing. The parking sprag sleeve has been eliminated by using a larger diameter attaching bolt. Don't pull that bolt all the way out or the sprag and spring will fall out. The reference book has complete details on removing the extension housing and bearing. You better tell Jimmy about the universal joint changes, Walt. Okay, Tech. Some Plymouth, Dodge, and Chrysler models have an inertia yoke that is integral with the rear of the front universal joint. This inertia yoke tends to damp out axle noise that is transmitted to the propeller shaft. Constant velocity U-joints are incorporated in New Yorker and Imperial drivelines. A constant velocity joint is actually two cross and roller joints with a device to maintain alignment. How does it work? Well, you know that when a universal joint operates at an angle, the speed of the driven member increases and decreases twice in each revolution. This is because the bearing journals revolve in different planes. Now, when the joints at the ends of a drive shaft have equal and opposite angles, these speed variations cancel out. Output speed then is constant with input, but the drive shaft speed isn't constant. The accelerating and decelerating of the drive shaft tends to set up vibration and noise under some conditions of speed and load. The condition is more severe in models having long prop shafts. A constant velocity joint acts like a very short drive shaft with equal and opposite angles. A centering ball and socket between the two crosses maintains correct angularity. Only the center yoke of the constant velocity joint changes speed. The drive shaft speed is constant with the transmission output shaft eliminating drive shaft vibrations. Okay, I understand that. What's next? The flanged axle shaft with tapered roller bearing design has been incorporated in all passenger cars except Dart, Valiant, and Barracuda. You already know about this design from the session on compact trucks, Jimmy. You bet, Tech. That's the design that lets you get at the rear brakes without a wheel puller. That's right, Jimmy. And speaking of brakes, the 10-inch brake is used on Valiants, Barracudas, and Darts with V8 engines in 1965. Other than that, there are only some lining changes. There's a brake lining color code chart in the reference book. Okay, Tech. Now, I notice this suspension system looks different. What's the story? Well, Chrysler and some models of Plymouth and Dodge have a lot of new features for a softer, quieter ride. The new suspension features front shocks that are mounted nearly vertical, new compression-type ball joints and wide-span upper control arms. There's a new cross member at the rear to mount the shocks. This member carries the shock load into the side rails instead of into the floor pan. On Chrysler and Dodge models, a rubber isolated cross member is used to anchor the torsion bars at the rear. Incidentally, you have to unwind the torsion bars and remove that cross member 
to remove the transmission or engine. Right, Tech. Now, there are two special tools for the new suspension. One to remove and install the upper control arm bushing, and one to remove the upper and lower ball joint studs. You better get this baby down on the floor so we can give instruments and accessories a quick once-over. Okay, Tech. Down she goes. Instrument cluster service procedures are new on Chrysler, Plymouth Fury, Dodge Polara, Custom 880, and Monaco. Be sure to check the manual before you try to service a cluster. Here's something else important. On cars with a torque flight shift indicator on the panel, be sure to disconnect the link or cable from the steering column to the indicator before lowering the column to remove the instrument cluster. Now tell them about uh, heater and air conditioning changes, Walt. There's a new design heater on Chrysler's and some Dodges and Plymouth's. Temperature is controlled by positioning the temperature control door to blend the right amount of warm and cold air. This eliminates the need for a water flow valve. This heater has a slide type control for the temperature control door and a four position blower switch. The heat shutoff door and defroster door are controlled by push buttons and vacuum actuators or by a second slide lever and cable. Now these same cars have fresh air vents at the cowl sides that operate independently of the heater. The side cowl vents are controlled mechanically by push-pull knobs and cables leading to the vent doors. You'll find adjustment procedures in the reference book. There's also a new combination heater and air conditioning unit for Valiant, Barracuda, and Dart models. This unit is mounted under the dash with controls in the center of the instrument panel and outlets under the panel. A vacuum actuated water flow valve shuts off hot water to the heater core during the cooling cycle. Temperature during cooling is controlled by a thermal switch which cycles the compressor clutch. The temperature selector lever and cable controls the setting of the thermal switch. The new air conditioning systems have the expansion valve, thermal bulb, and equalizer tube located for easier service. The thermal bulb and equalizer tube are connected into the suction line near the dash panel. A rubber cap seals the thermal bulb to the suction line to keep out moisture. Before we run out of time, Walt, let me have a quick word with all the master technicians. There's a lot more new in 1965 than we've had time to cover. Walt and I have tried to give you the highlights so you'll know what to watch for. But there's a lot more good information in the new reference book. So study the reference book and use the information it contains. And use your 1965 service manuals too. Keep up the good work throughout the next model year.